This is a city in Jiangsu province where workers protested with a strike after a major shoe factory announced it would shut down its factory in China at the end of the year and relocate it to Indonesia. It's a scene that's playing out in many parts of China. It has been widely noted that the unemployment rate in China is rising, especially among young people, to the point where the government has announced that it will no longer release related data. Taiwan's Kuomintang KMT presidential candidate is apparently willing to help out in the face of China's woes. Overseas students, especially those from mainland China, are welcome to come to Taiwan to study. And after studying in Taiwan, gradually given the opportunity, they are also welcome to join the workforce. This means that if this KMT representative is elected, Taiwan will open its doors to a massive influx of young Chinese from mainland China looking for work. Would that happen? Taiwan's presidential election will be held on January 13, 2024. In less than two months, the election will pick out a new president and legislators for Taiwan. Previously, we reported that the much-anticipated blue-white coalition of Taiwan's opposition parties, who planned to team up and put forward a group of presidential candidates, broke down on the night of November 23, 2023. Political parties in Taiwan are often referred to by their colors. Currently, the top-ranked candidate in the polls is Lai ching -de. He belongs to the Green Camp DPP and is the Vice President of the Republic of China, or ROC. The DPP is one of Beijing's most hated political parties because of its strong anti-CCP stance. The Green Camp candidate incumbent Vice President Lai is currently leading in the polls. In the opposition is the Blue Camp candidate Ho Yo Yi of the KMT, Taiwan's centuries-old party who has a long background in police affairs and whom we call Sheriff Ho. In recent years, the White Camp Taiwan People's Party Kerwin Zhe has risen to prominence. Before he entered politics, he was a doctor or Dr. Ker. In the run-up to previous general elections in Taiwan, the Beijing authorities have continuously tried to influence Taiwanese voters by means of military pressure, economic coercion, and public appeals in order to canvass votes for the political parties and candidates favored by Beijing. It is no exception this time. Reports of Taiwanese businessmen in need of resources or markets in mainland China have recently been aired extensively both in China and overseas. To make skincare products, we need resources from both sides of the strait. From Taiwan's raw materials to factories on the mainland, it's all closely related. Xiamen acts as a transit hub, so I choose Xiamen because of its geographical convenience. I think we need to have exchanges no matter what. There should be more exchanges between people. It's one thing whether official exchanges are taking place or not, but if people are talking to each other, it's impossible for the officials to ignore those people-to-people -people exchanges. Wen Renda, also from Taiwan, now serves as the CEO of Xiamen Yashan Trading Company. Having been engaged in cross-strait fruit shipping businesses for almost two decades, Wen said the links have made it much easier to deliver fresh fruits from Taiwan to mainland consumers. So what's the central issue in determining the direction of Taiwan's elections? It's the young people in Taiwan. After the collapse of the Blue-White Coalition, the polls of the white representative Dr. Kerr of the Taiwan's People's Party TPP, are rapidly falling. Dr. Kerr's votes are mainly concentrated between voters in their 20s and 40s. With his polls on the verge of collapse, many young people may need to make a new choice. Outside of the stable bases of the blue and green camps, which are closely matched, who the young people will vote for and how many of them will go to the polls, should have a decisive impact on the presidential election in January 2024. According to official statistics, in the last Taiwan presidential election in 2020, the turnout rate of Taiwanese voters in their 20s and 30s was around 70%, lower than that of middle-aged and older voters. The government estimates that one-fifth of Taiwan's population is between the ages of 20 and 34. One characteristic of young voters in their 20s and 40s is that they are brave to take a stand online, 
but that voice may not translate into turnout unless they are spurred on by a special event or called upon by a charismatic candidate. After two terms of President Tsai Ing-wen, a Green Party member, the DPP is no longer a novelty. Therefore, the shared slogan of both the Blue and White camps is, Change of political parties, DPP out. Especially the Blue Camp, the KMT, has huge media resources, because behind this party stands the Beijing government. The Beijing government has invested a huge amount of money in foreign propaganda. The KMT's logic is that only by cooperating with the CCP on many fronts and by not provoking the CCP will there be peace in Taiwan. And that peace is the prerequisite for a happy life for the people of Taiwan. We will definitely win back the Republic of China so that the people of Taiwan can be at ease and healthy. Thanks, everyone. The Green DPP believes that the ROC is not actually subordinate to the People's Republic of China, while the Beijing government calls this view Taiwan's independence, implying that it could lead to war. The DPP authorities' attempts to solicit U.S. support for Taiwan independence is turning Taiwan into an arsenal and an island of explosives. It will only plunge Taiwan into the abyss and bring nothing but disaster to Taiwan compatriots. Taiwan security depends on peaceful development of cross-strait relations. It is totally unreliable to count on some U.S.-made arms. The PLA will stay ready to firmly safeguard our sovereignty and territorial integrity and firmly safeguard the peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. In early November, the Taiwan government released data showing that the average economic growth rate over the past eight years of the DPP's government has been 3.4 percent, which is the highest performance among the four little dragons in Asia, namely Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. Especially during the epidemic, driven by supply chain reorganization, Taiwan's economic growth rate broke 12.7 percent one of the few countries in the world that grew against the trend during the epidemic, and Taiwan's trade volume has continued to grow over the past eight years. During these eight years, Taiwan's stock market performance is particularly impressive, with an increase of 111% compared to 99% in Japan, 8% in China, and negative 10% in Hong Kong. However, the current Taiwanese government is also facing some problems. Many young workers earn relatively low incomes in small companies, inflation threatens to eat into small pay raises, and housing prices are rising in many cities. In interviews, these young voters cited rising housing costs, slow income growth, and limited job prospects as their problems. The Blue KMT is also keen to divert young votes from Dr. Kerr, but they need to maintain a close relationship with Beijing. For Beijing, opening up Taiwan's service sector market is high on its wish list. The Cross Straits Trade and Service Agreement was almost passed back in 2014 under KMT President Ma Ying-jeou. It was shelved because students started the Sunflower Movement. Why did the students oppose this agreement? Because according to WTO standards, Taiwan is a developed country and China is a developing country. So according to the agreement, goods from China can be dumped into developed Taiwan as much as they want, and Chinese companies and workers can enter Taiwan in a big way to do business and work. On the other hand, because China is a developing country, Taiwan cannot have the same access to the mainland market. The CCP has always claimed that it has the nation-building advantage. That is, it can make use of the planned economy to mobilize the resources of the whole country on a scale that will destroy the private enterprises in developed countries. Once this agreement is passed, it can be said that it will be a catastrophe for Taiwan's economy and employment. Now Sheriff Ho has announced that he will open up the door for mainland Chinese students to come to Taiwan to study and work and that he will quickly restart negotiations on the shelved cross Straits trade and service agreement. Experts from the Blue Camp believe that Taiwan's higher education is in dire straits and that without the injection of mainland Chinese students, many universities would have closed down. The more mainland students come to Taiwan, the stronger the impression of democracy will be among the mainlanders. In addition, the mainlanders who come to Taiwan will spend money to promote economic development and have expertise to contribute to the Taiwanese society. 
According to China's National Bureau of Statistics, in June 2023, China's youth unemployment rate was 21 percent, and the urban unemployment rate was 5.2 percent. And then China suspended the publication of the unemployment rate because the figures were too alarming. In other words, the youth unemployment rate alone has already exceeded six million. If China were to fully allow Chinese people to come to Taiwan for employment, it's likely that tens of millions of unemployed Chinese would flood into the Taiwanese job market, thus depriving Taiwanese of their jobs and interests in large numbers. It seems that Hou Youyi is determined to follow the same old path of dependence on China. Not only accepting the 1992 consensus, but also restarting the service trade agreement. He also wants to accept people from China to come to Taiwan to work. This is completely unguarded against China, which will result in a serious mass unemployment problem in Taiwan, impacting on the society as well as the various industries in Taiwan. It'll also have a significant impact on national security. I will definitely work hard to unite the strengths of the people of Taiwan to prevent these things from happening. We must steadfastly continue to strengthen Taiwan on the path of democracy, and this is the path that Taiwan must take. It is conceivable that this advocacy by the Blue Camp will scare away the votes of a number of young Taiwanese. The KMT's vice presidential candidate Zhao Shao Kang, 73, is a pro-communist media mogul. He is an eloquent and confident speaker with a strong ability to create publicity. Since he was nominated to join the campaign, his online presence on both sides of the Taiwan Strait has skyrocketed, even surpassing that of the Commander in Chief Sheriff Ho. As soon as Zhao stepped onto the stage as a vice presidential candidate, he began to focus loudly on the topic of war and peace. China's social media platforms such as Weibo have also been widely spreading his voice. We are already at the tipping point between war and peace. How can we push Taiwan towards war? How can we send our young people to sacrifice? How can we drive Taiwan's stability and prosperity to destruction? Many people say, "Do you want war or peace?" Ladies and gentlemen, war and peace have never been a question of choice. We have only one answer, and that is peace. War is not an option for us. Do we go to war? What war? There must be peace on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. The KMT said that it has the means to maintain peace, stability, and development in the Taiwan Strait through enhanced dialogues and exchanges with the Chinese authorities, and that a vote for the DPP is tantamount to sending everyone to the battlefield. Then how does the DPP respond? But the opposition party incessantly engages in alarmist talk. They say that 2024 is a choice between war and peace. I want to ask you all here: Does anyone want war? Nobody wants war. Do we want peace? Everyone wants peace. Look at Hong Kong and think of Taiwan. We don't want Hong Kong-style peace. We want dignified peace. Everyone, am I right? Speaking at a campaign rally held by DPP candidates Lai and Shao in Taipei, Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen said voters can look at Hong Kong now and envision a scene of so-called peace once the opposition party wins the election. Tsai is not in the running for this election because she has been in office for two consecutive presidential terms. During her eight years in power, she has always made strengthening national defense a priority for Taiwan, and has successfully launched the National Aircraft National Build and National Ship National Build programs. To ensure peace, we need to strengthen our ability to defend ourselves. Our house will have locks on it, but not to provoke our neighbors. By heightening defenses, we want to achieve more security. What's true for our home doors is also true for our country. As we all know, with bigger sense of security, we can get rid of some sense of crisis. To not think of anything is the most dangerous. Everyone, am I right? Vice President Lai also recognized the current election in Taiwan as a major election for peace and security in the Indo-Pacific. Taiwan's security and peace in the Indo-Pacific are a focal point of international concern. The whole world is watching this election. 
How will the people of Taiwan ultimately choose between trusting Taiwan, allowing Taiwan to continue to move forward on the road of democracy and relying on China, following the old path of the One China principle and walking into the embrace of China? Perhaps some young people in Taiwan don't care about these things. The question of whether Taiwan will become Hong Kong seems distant and unimportant to them. Here is a charity event in Taiwan on November 30th of this year. Next to Lin Shang, a popular girl on the internet in Taiwan, was Uncle Zhao, a KMT vice presidential candidate. When footage and pictures of Zhao clinging to the girl on stage came out, many young people were upset and wrote, Let go of that girl. Zhao responded, It's a matter of perspective. People who have a dirty mind look at other people in a dirty way. The most interesting part of the story is the response from the girl, an online celebrity. Who is he? Zhao Xiao Kong. Oh. Do you know he's running for vice president? No, I'm not sure. <laughs> Such is a situation that's perhaps similar to that of many young Hong Kongers before 2019, who found politics and political celebrities strange. It's just that Hong Kong people went through that red stain time. Now they understand what has been lost. For the rest of the episode, let's take a look at the story of Agnes Chow, a Hong Kong girl. We wish that young people in Taiwan could get to know her story as well. Hong Kong people anger will not be stopped because um, even the government retract the extradition bill, but um, the police violence and abuse of power of the police and also of the Hong Kong government is still continuing. So the anger of Hong Kong people, the discontents of Hong Kong people would only continue in this case. Agnes Chow is a former member of the Hong Kong student organization, Demo Sisto. She is also known as Mulan of Hong Kong. Her peers said that without the student movement, Agnes Chow would have been a well-behaved sunny girl. She loves life and is fascinated by Japanese pop culture. On many occasions, Agnes Chow broadcasted live on social media platforms in fluent Japanese, gaining a large number of Japanese fans. Hong Kong was originally a British colony. When sovereignty was transferred to China in 1997, Beijing promised to maintain Hong Kong's capitalist lifestyle and high degree of autonomy for 50 years on the basis of one country, two systems. One country, two systems is also the proposal put forward by Beijing to resolve the Taiwan issue. After Hong Kong's return to China, the Beijing authorities repeatedly eroded Hong Kong's freedom and democracy, refusing to allow Hong Kong to hold genuine one-person, one-vote elections for the chief executive and the legislative council by universal suffrage in accordance with the basic law. The basic law was supposed to be free from manipulation by Beijing. In 2019, Hong Kong underwent a six-month-long outbreak of large-scale and intensely anti-government, anti-extradition movement. At the end of June 2020, Beijing imposed the national security law in Hong Kong, which not only completely blocked freedom of the press and expression, but also put a large number of pro-democracy activists in prison, completely destroying the promise of one country, two systems. On December 2, 2020, Agnes Chow was sentenced to 10 months in prison for inciting others to participate in an unauthorized assembly. I could be in jail for the first time in my life today or in the near future. Of course, I do feel anxious about the unforeseen future and the upcoming verdict, but I hope everyone doesn't forget our fellow friends who have sacrificed more than us. In her online posts, Agnes Chow also said that she was plagued by fear and worry during her incarceration, and that she was always reminded of the scenes of house searches by the national security, sentencing being locked up with handcuffs, and being stripped naked for correctional inspections. On June 12, 2021, Chow left the prison. In the years since her release, Agnes Chow didn't participate in any public activities and stopped socializing with her friends. Still, she didn't get the right to leave the country. Her passport was confiscated and she was required to report to the National Security Police on a regular basis. Recently, she told the media that every time she reported to the National Security Police, she was worried that she would be arrested again at any time. 
Even when she returned home, she always pictured the past. Would the National Security Police knock on her door early one morning, break the lock, break in, and take her away again on some charge? She was plagued by these thoughts every day, and there was nothing she could do but cry, break down, tremble, and tell her friends about her fears. She has since been diagnosed by doctors with anxiety, panic disorder, post traumatic stress disorder, and depression. Agnes Chow decided to enroll in a master's program and applied to study in Canada. After receiving a conditional offer from a Canadian institution, she applied to the Hong Kong National Security Police NSP, for permission to leave the country and was asked by the NSP to sign a letter of repentance, admitting that she regretted her involvement in the pro democracy political activities of the past and promising that she would not contact the relevant people, including members of Scholarism and Demo Sisto. In July 2023, Agnes Chow was informed by the state security that if she wanted to pursue further studies in Canada, she had to go back to mainland China with them once. In August, Agnes Chow was accompanied by five state security officers to Shenzhen, where she was arranged to visit the Reform and Opening Up exhibition and the headquarters of Tencent. After returning to Hong Kong, Agnes Chow was asked by the national security officers to write thank you letters, such as, Thank you for the arrangements made by the police, which enabled me to learn about the great development of the motherland. Agnes Chow left Hong Kong in mid-September this year to attend school in Toronto. She was originally scheduled to return to Hong Kong at the end of December to report to the police on the national security law case. However, after thinking about it, including the situation in Hong Kong, she decided not to go back to report to the police and probably won't go back for the rest of her life. I have to go back to Hong Kong and appear before the authorities in December this year, but I have decided not to return to Hong Kong. I can't go back to Hong Kong. I've decided that I will probably never go back. I had things like depression and PTSD. I really couldn't do anything during the three years I was in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong police, as well as China's state news agency, have issued press releases severely condemning Agnes Chow's blatant indication of jumping bail and absconding from the country. The police announced, The woman was arrested on August 10, 2020, on suspicion of violating the crime of collusion with a foreign power. The police also appealed to Chow not to choose to take the road of no return and bear the name of fugitive for the rest of her life.